Hello one and all, my name is John Clare, this is John's Dark Art, and as always, you are very welcome. Today's piece that I'd like to talk about is a piece I call Human Condition. I'm gonna bring it up for you here now. As you can see, it's quite a morbid looking piece, you know, skulls and ravens and talking about death. I know John's talking about death in one of his videos, shock horror. But it's quite a cool piece. I did it, I think a few years ago now. It's a piece I wanna talk about, so I'm going to. Oh, and just in case you're wondering, I've got tendonitis in my right hand, so just in case you thought I bought one of those new goofy drawing gloves, no, I haven't. I just hurt my wrist. So anyway, let's jump into human condition. Let's talk about the process, and we'll do that now. Okay, so here we are. We are in Procreate. So I'm gonna to go to my finished work folder, and I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom to find human condition, which is here. And yeah, it's quite a dark piece. That's by design, by the way. And, you know, I've had a few people in the past tell me that um, I like your work, John, but your work is a, a bit too dark for my tastes. And to that I respond, uh, yeah, that's by design, mate. I'm the artist. I'm trying to communicate things regarding death and mortality and, you know, examining one's own mortality in the face of mortality, so to speak. I know it sounds kind of pretentious, but then, you know, I'm an artist, so I am kind of pretentious in a, to a degree. Uh, anyway, what I'm going to do now is I'm going into canvas information. There we go. And this piece was started on the 17th of June, 2020. So this was during the height of COVID. Everyone remembers that particular fantastic time in our lives, don't they? Anyway, total strokes made was 10,026 and track time was 22 hours and five minutes. Uh, again, much like last week's piece, the information here is a little bit misleading because this is one of those pieces I kind of cobbled together a few di different elements to create a completely new artwork. And I'll explain how that went on later. We'll hop in now to the time lapse replay. We'll hit that now. One, sh oh yeah, one should die proudly when it's no longer possible to live proudly. That was uh, Frederick Nietzsche, you know, because I was feeling in a particularly cheery mood that day. Anyway, I scroll on a little bit, and this is what I'm do uh, what I'm doing now is I'm very, very, very roughly marking out the skull. So as you can probably tell, like throughout the course of this you'll notice i'll do a lot of refining i find when i'm drawing skulls especially drawing skulls my drawing tends to be a bit more sculptural if that makes any sense i suppose in a way you could say a lot of my drawing style is very sculptural because of the way i draw like adding bits and taking bits away it's very similar to if you were if you were sculpting something out of clay you're always carving bits off to find the piece and I suppose in a way that's kind of my drawing style so again here I'm roughing things out refining the top of the head and the where the layout of the skull and then getting into my usual cross hatching style adding bits taking bits away as I've said god knows how many times in my videos prior and just kind of finding out the details like if you notice, if I zoom in here a little bit, you know, it's what I do. If I want to bring in some like very kind of like, I think the term is specular highlights. I'm not too sure, but it's like when you see light being reflected off a, into a dark surface, it's, it kind of sometimes brings out highlights of particular forms and structures. And I think this is what elevates a lot of drawing, not just mine, but other people's drawings as well. When you're not just dealing in blacks and whites, you are dealing in the shades of gray. Being able to kind of like pick out certain details in the dark to add form, uh, to give a drawing more structure, to give the object that you're drawing more structure, I think is um, pretty important to kind of really kind of give life to your drawing. As well as finding the details, like finding the details in the, the, the where the where the bones are fused, like those little lines along here. And if I scroll back a little bit, so you can kind of see it there where I'm kind of picking out the details, using not just line work but also kind of using highlights. So like by erasing in the same brush that I'm using, I'm able to pick out those highlights. You can also do it by changing the colour. I mean, again. Most artists have different ways of doing exactly the same thing. That I don't think there's a necessarily a right or wrong way. There is just your way. You will find the best uh, way to deal with particular problems that you come across, and you'll find your own solutions to those problems. So, building out the structure again, 
filling out the details, using my cross hatching, using my uh, building up my tones, finding my details. Sketching in around the teeth there as well. I mean, skulls are fascinating to draw. I love drawing skulls. Um, I think it's the same for a lot of artists, uh, irrespective of their style, because there is so much detail in there that you can, you know, I know they're, they're what's under our faces, but they, there's a lot of like really interesting detail to draw. A lot of interesting little forms to find within the drawing, within the, the object that you are drawing. I mean, the teeth are a bit finicky, but the, you know, it is what it is. You put in the time, you put in the work, and hopefully, you know, you're happy with the end result. Also, another thing, like artistic license. If I zoom in a little bit, I scroll back a touch. Now, you'll notice this line here, okay? Now, that was in the original skull, and it's a basically it's the form at the base of the skull where the, the skull connects onto the neck but i just didn't think it needed to be there in terms of the form of the drawing and it, it kind of gave greater sym symmetry by just getting rid of it so i did and that is perfectly okay you know just because a drawing is representative doesn't mean you can't use artistic license if you don't think something needs to be there then get rid of it um so anyway building out finding the details, picking out the highlights again, finding the form, and that's it. Now, you notice that the, uh, the raven kind of appears out of nowhere, but notice that I once, I once I brought him in, I added more shading because what I wanted to do is I wanted him to feel like he was part of the drawing. I added like little, oh, you know, little shadows underneath his feet there where his claws meet the skull to give the impression that he's actually perched up on it. And then blacking out the background. Now I know there are people out there who will have a far more efficient way of integrating, but I didn't find a way at the time. So I just did this. What I did was I just dropped the color in, then I erased roughly where the um, skull and raven were then back, it went back in with a pen afterwards uh, with um, technical pen, the pen I use quite a lot with my rubbings out, I use that to fill back out these details. Basically give it a more kind of, a, a much starker black on, to give it basically a sense of chiaroscuro, which is essentially, if you, you know, my, my favorite artist of all time, Michelangelo Maurizio di Caravaggio. He uses a lot of chiaroscuro in a lot, especially in his later work. And I wanted this to be a bit more of a Curoscuro Caravaggio's influence style piece. So anyway, what we're going to do now, I'm going to hop out of this one and I'm going to show you where that Raven came from, which was this one here. Raven, Crow, Corbid, it's all interchangeable. And just to give you an idea, if we go to the time, um, if we go into uh, canvas information, now we go into statistics, statistics um, this took me about 12 hours and I made 3,181 strokes, so which is quite efficient for me. If we hop into time -lapse replay, hell is empty, all the devils are here. If anyone wants to know where that's from, that's William Shakespeare, that's The Tempest. Go up, move along a little bit. And much in the same way as you've seen me draw a few of these Corvids in the past, it is literally rough it out, rough out the general shape. Uh, resize where I need to and then fill out the details and then take my sweet time in doing so because it always takes me a bloody long time to do these drawings so I might as well take my time drawing on my feathers getting the structure right and then filling in afterwards using um, line work to, fit, uh, to create those details within the feathers to make them look more convincing, more apparent. And then kind of adding highlights later to kind of give form to the drawing. See, this is the thing is like, again, when it comes down to using highlights, when it comes down to using shading or contrast, um, it's a good idea not to go too dark because things with black is an incredibly powerful tone. It's not a color, it's a tone. White, black, and all the grays in between, 
those are tons and that's what primarily I work with so you need to use as many of those tones as possible if you go too dark it looks almost like a photoshop it looks like um not a photoshop um ends up looking like a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy where you get very strong contrast between white and black but you get nothing in the middle so it's something to bear in mind when you're doing these kinds of drawings go back to drawing the feathers picking out the highlights now the fet the wing in the background you'll notice that what i've done is essentially i basically almost virtually just blacked it out and then kind of used um my eraser brush to kind of just pick away pick out some certain details and that gives it additional form then it's not just a black blotch or a black shape it it's it forms part of a cohesive whole of the rest of the drawing and it's the same here as well like even with the rear feet even with that rear foot there you know that's very much in the background and it's kind of dark so therefore then you can kind of get away with it a little bit where you if you just want to pick out the shape in shade you can do that and then when when i transferred this image over to the human the final piece of human condition that's the end of that there now so we'll transfer back into human condition very briefly you can see there now that um you can still see that that foot so again there is still something there that is tangible against a very starkly black background so anyway, that's the end of human condition. But another thing I wanted to show you, another thing about like inserting images from and creating new pieces with assets that you already have, is that there was another piece that I did. Um, this was a part of a tattoo design someone asked me to do. And you'll notice that this is the same skull that I used in human condition. But the difference there is, I'll show you once we get into time maps replay and we scrub on it a little bit. So what I did was I found, I pieced together two different images. So I used the blade from this and the hilt from this. I traced them because I was lazy. And then I shaded the details in afterwards. So we'll punch in a little bit. And I only did it for one of these swords because all I did then was I duplicated that four times and then positioned each one of those swords where I wanted them. And then what I did there was, I erased the bits I didn't need. I kept the bits that I did need. And then basically folded all the images together. For, I basically compressed my layers and then shaded in over the top and created an entirely new piece from an old piece, which is Again, a really useful thing about working with digital medium, I think. So anyway, I think what we'll do now is we'll round this out now, shall we? Anyway, so that was human condition. I'm pretty happy with it. And I'm also happy with the tattoo design. Uh, hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil. And the fact that I was able to create two different pieces from one singular artwork or one asset, if you like, one art asset, I think it turned out pretty well. I think both turned out pretty well, actually. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to put both of them up on sale on my website, www.johnstarkart.com. So if you like to uh, like what we do and you want to support us, you can do that by buying one of the two prints. The sizes are A3 at 75 euros and A4 at 45 euros. If you would like to pick one up, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you very much. So yeah, in terms about this piece, I mean, yes, it is an examination on mortality. I mean, how could it not be? It's something that I do think about quite a lot. And then again, thinking about death doesn't mean, you know, you're morbid and miserable all the time. Sometimes you need to think about, I think, especially when you're young, you don't necessarily realize how finite your life is. But when I got to this stage in my life and say to my mid thirties, these are questions that became very prominent in my thinking. And I wanted to express that somehow. And I did that via the medium of art. And the fact that you can then take an asset and then reuse it somewhere else and have a completely different meaning to it, I think is pretty cool. 
I mean, it's one of the amazing things about working with technology. I mean, technology allows us to be more versatile, create new and different styles of work, be able to reuse assets. I, mean, I think the thing I want to get to with this is this. Right now, and this is a topic I've touched on before, there's a huge hubbub around AI art. Is it art? Is it not? Look, yes, it's art. Like it or lump it, it is what it is. You know, there is new work being created. Now, am I worried about AI art? Yes, I am. Does that make me a technophobe? No, it doesn't because I use technology in the creation of my work, right? I'm using a very expensive drawing tablet and a very expensive stylus. And I am also recording this on expensive cameras and editing it on my laptop. You know, we are using really good audio equipment now. Like the fact is like, we are using technology to create and artists invariably are at the forefront of utilizing technology to create art. This has been the top, this has been the way since we sprayed ochre onto a wall in uh, what's the name of the place, Roman? The cave in France. Um, Chavois? Let's go. Let's go. Um, it's the same with like the Let's Go caves in France. Ever since the, um, we saw those paintings of the Let's Go ca uh, uh, caves in France, where people were basically spraying ochre from a tube onto the back of their hands to create forms. Like, that was a way we used we used a technological process to create an image. It's exactly the same with this. The difference with AI is that work is being created off the backs of other artists with no compensation, with no recognition. They're just scraping data and creating work. And then somebody types a prompt in and calls themselves an AI artist. Neglecting the fact that me, and God knows how many artists out there who are busting their humps to get good at their craft, to develop their craft. Their work is used without their permission. There's no opt out. It's only opt in, whether you like it or lump it. It does create issues. And to say that it doesn't, I mean, to turn around and say, oh, it's just the same as when the cotton gin was uh, created. No, it's not the same. The cotton gin, yes, right, still needed human operation in order to create a reel of cotton. It's not the same as when photography came in because you still needed to right, set the camera up, dial it in, take your shot. You still needed to develop it afterwards. Even with digital cameras, there was this whole hubbub when digital cameras came to the fore in the late 90s. It's not real photography because, you know, you don't have to do any development afterwards. Well, you do, but you do it, use a different process. Instead of using a dark room, you use Adobe Lightroom on your computer in order to get the image that you want. You're still developing and it's still an active process, an active process of creation. Typing in a prompt and have it spit out something for you is not a active process of creation it is you giving a computer a prompt and that computer spitting out hundreds of images and most of them at the moment are either very mediocre or not very good but that's going to change because the one phrase i keep hearing and it's very true this is as bad as ai is ever going to be it's going to get better now does this give people like me and art artists like me a moment's pause? Yes, it does. Is it concerning? Yes, it is. But the thing is, and this is where I'm going to try and offer a ray of hope, is that artists have always been at the forefront of technological advances and being able to create things with that technology. And I'm hoping that rather than just typing in a prompt and spitting out work and then calling yourself an artist. Artists, true artists, artists, people who create. That's the, that's the dividing line for me. People who create images, create music, 
um, whatever, create, write poetry, write books. They utilize the AI to augment their process and to better their work. And I think that inevitably that will happen. Those tools will then be utilized by creatives in order to create more creative work. Unfortunately, you're going to have a lot of scam artists and charlatans and ne'er-do-wells who will call themselves artists because they type a prompt into ChatGPT or Midjourney or whatever. I'm sorry, but to be a little bit controversial here, no, you ain't. You are merely a prompt typer, if for lack of a better term. Right now, I think because of the furore and the hubbub around it, um, you are going to get these contrasting takes and eventually uh, a new normal will settle in. May take a bit of time. I'm going to be stubborn and not use it at all. There are those who will then take that technology and run with it. Like Corridor Digital, as, um, uh, as I mentioned in one of the first videos we did on this channel, created an animation using AI, but then using their own technolog technological processes afterwards went in, refined, bettered, um, increase the quality of the images. Now, is it top tier? No. But if they hone those um, t techniques and hone those uh, programs and those various th um, tools that they use, then I don't see there being any reason why that can't happen. And it creating its own variation animation. I think there still always will be uh, a need for a handcrafted touch for anything like animation or art or whatever else. But I think that in of itself, AI is not creative. It's just basically regurgitating what other people have done before. It's only when artists get their hands on these tools, then they'll be able to do something with them. But the fact that there is so much consternation with artists within the artistic community, I think that that concern is justified. Those eyebrows being raised need to be raised. Um, the fact that the the fact that artwork was scraped off the internet that's bullshit and should not be allowed to happen the fact that it has been allowed to happen i think is absolutely atrocious and the fact that they've been used uh, that this has been allowed to be done under the guise of them being charitable organizations is again bullshit but the genie's out of the bottle now so what do we do and that is the question that I'm not going to be able to answer in this video or in any other video that I make. Only we will find out in time how the dust settles and what happens once the genie has been let out of the bowl. And the one hope I do have is that it doesn't negate artists. It doesn't negate human creativity. It will get rid of the likes of people on Fiverr underselling themselves for five euros and a drawing or 25 euros for a painting. Maybe it will start making artists value their work more. Who knows? But there are those who are concerned by saying that this devalues art as a whole. Again, these are questions that we're not going to be able to answer in the near term. We're only going to be able to figure this out over time. But we will figure this out. And I don't honestly feel that artists in whatever field that they operate in are going to necessarily be relegated to, to, to history. I think there will always be a place for creative people and people who are creating. And I hope that gives people hope that there is a future for them as artists and they're not discouraged in order to create art. And they share it with the world in whatever way they see fit. My name has been John Clare. This has been John Starkheart, and as always, you've been very welcome. Till next time.